Amen? God is good. So, this morning, um, we have uh, Kelly and Donna are actually here with us today. We're so excited about that. And, um, and, and we want to bring them up. And as they're coming up, I just uh, want to kind of remind you guys of kind of where the elders have, have, have come in this journey in, in inviting them to come and be part of our, our, our church here. Um, we just were sensing that that, that structure in the church, you know, the, who knew what was going to happen about a year and a half ago when God, come on up, Kelly, and if I can call the other elders and their wives, if you could come up too, that would be, that would be great. I think Donna's in Pitt's church. Donna is already hard at work. We can't, uh, we're already thankful for her for that, for that reason. Um, so yeah, we just felt that, that God was blessing our church beyond what we could uh, measure, and that's just like God to do that. Um, and... We felt, like, we felt like we needed some more structure. We felt like we, we kind of, I think of like a plant that's growing, and it, and it needs a trellis to grow along, you know, and, and, and you, need, you need some more structure. And, and um, I knew Kelly had had lots of experience. I've been friends with Kelly now for oh, over five years now, and, and uh, we've always had a, a, a good time visiting together, encouraging each other in the ministry. Those of you who don't already know, Kelly is also a professor at uh, Prairie Bible Institute, so... Anyway, he, he has felt led, Don and him have felt led to come and be part of our church and be part of the team here, and uh, we just want to uh, recognize that, and we want to pray for him as, uh, as they're just getting started, and, and uh, as Daryl mentioned last week, um, at this point, he's, he's very, Don and Kelly are very part-time, they're, they're, they're doing like um, less than 20 hours anyways a week uh, for the church, we basically have told them, you know what, you figure out what you, you, you think needs to be done, and, and, and keep track of your hours, and and we would be glad to uh, support you in that way. Um, but yeah, we just want to pray for you guys. And, uh, and, and Kelly, maybe just, uh, do we have a microphone? I just was going to ask Kelly one question. And that question was like, like what are you, and then I'll maybe ask Donna the same question, but what are you kind of thinking you're going to be getting started on kind of early in, in this whole journey? <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday, by the way. Um, oh. Yeah, we, uh, Is it on? Yeah, we, uh, we just look forward to uh, getting to uh, serve the church family and getting to know uh, each of you. Not all at once. It'd be overwhelming. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that really is dear to my heart is uh, small groups. And uh, that's one of the things I'd really love. If you are a small group leader or you're thinking of leading a small group, if you'd come and talk to me about that, uh, just so I get to know who you are. And then the second thing that I'm really passionate about is leadership development. And that's kind of what I do at Prairie. And uh, so that's one of the things that we'd love to uh, be able to serve you in, in that way, coming alongside and figuring out, hey, what are your spiritual gifts and what are your passions at heart and what are your skills and to put those uh, to work for the kingdom of God. And so that's something that, yeah. Uh, one other thing uh, that I just want to mention is uh, Pastor Don and I have been talking about uh, Christianity Explored. And it's a great tool. It's like Alpha. And so we're thinking, this is a little trailer uh, we're thinking of maybe January uh, kicking that off. But if you're new to the faith or you want to just check out what this Christianity thing is all about and who Jesus is, uh, that's coming up in January. Mm-hmm. Donna, the question is, is like, what do you see yourself kind of getting at after like early in this journey of being part of our team here at the church? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm already starting to figure out the Sunday school um, program, the Stepping Stones, and um, just coming alongside the volunteers and trying to make um, their job as teachers for our children um, easier. Mm -hmm. And so just having stuff ready for them and just trying to figure out the the curriculum, which by the way, I've looked at and it's amazing. Um, And I've met a lot of the volunteers and they are amazing too. So um, I would really encourage you guys, if you have kids in, in our stepping stones and pebbles, that. You remember to thank those volunteers for all the hard work that they're doing because they are doing a great job. So, yeah. Mm. Thanks, Donna. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, the end of kind of, or late, late June when we sort of took a little break from Sunday school, um, I talked to all the leaders that did a fabulous job last year in the uh, Stepping Stones and, and Pebbles and everything. And they all said, you know, it was, it was a great year with the kids, but it, we really could use some more support. And then I said, well, what about one of you? Um, you know, they're kind of the four ladies that were really uh, focusing in on giving our, our le- leadership in that way last year. 
And they all said, we would love to, but this isn't the right time in our life for this. So we began praying that God would provide someone else, and, and Don is who he's provided us with. So we're very thankful for that, too. Um, so, yeah, let's just uh, pray for you guys. Yeah. Maybe move in and put our hands on these guys. And... All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for Kelly and Donna, and I thank you for from the, the first time they came to our church. Uh, they both sensed that maybe there was a future here for them. And uh, Lord, they, they, they hung on to that for like a year and kept praying about it. And, and Lord, we, we weren't sure at the first because we weren't sure we were ready to take that step yet, and, and, uh, and, and they weren't either. But, but now it seems like the timing is there, and, and uh, our church is definitely growing, and, and we need that support that, that, and experience that Kelly and Donna can bring to the different ministries here. And I just pray that you'd really bless their efforts and, and use them in mighty ways. May your Holy Spirit just work mightily through them uh, to minister to not just our congregation, but to the whole community around us, Lord. Carstairs, Didsbury, Crossfield, Olds, all of Mountain View County, all the world, really, Lord. Um, we just thank you that, uh, that, that they're willing to offer up their gifts um, to bless us. And uh, we pray that they would just find great joy in... in in their ministry here and and that you would just they would just constantly have a sense of your presence with them working through them and uh giving them um all that they need because lord whenever we take on something like this we feel like uh you know who am i to be to be doing this but but lord we know that we can do all things through him who gives us strength and so we just pray that over um kelly and donna at this time we pray in jesus name amen thanks guys yeah all right Glad to have you. Yeah, um, so now we'll transition a little bit to the next thing, and that is, of course, Israel. And, um, you know, in the Bible, it's very clear that we have been engrafted in as the Gentiles. We've been engrafted in as part of God's people. And um, so, so God isn't done with Israel. Israel is still very much uh, uh, as a special place in God's heart. They were the ones, they were the people that were declared as, as God's people. And now as the church, we get that as well, that we too are God's people, and uh, we share that together with Israel. And so when our brothers are hurting, we want to pray for them. And um, in, in Psalm 22, verse 6, we're told very clearly, it says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, may they prosper who love you. That's Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Now, some of you may have been busy this weekend, you weren't kind of paying attention to the news, and this all happened yesterday, but he ba basically what happened, to the best of my knowledge, I'll just give you a little synopsis, I'm sure there's a lot more information out there now, but Israel was attacked by Hamas, and they were attacked in a way that was much more severe than what they have been being attacked many, many times over. We, we hear about, unfortunately, Israel getting attacked all the time, because this time, a lot of the missiles that Hamas shot at, um, Israel got through the Iron Dome, and there are at least, I think, 200 people dead, as well as 100 people that have been abducted and carried into the Gaza Strip, and then, I was told, paraded around and these kinds of things, so it's, it's a hard time. Um, the Prime Minister of Israel has uh, declared war, and this is the first time that there has been a war declared in Israel since, like, 19, I think, 72, and so it, it's much more serious than what we hear all the time in the news, and and I just want to, you know, maybe we could just huddle together for this one uh, with the group, whoever you're kind of sitting with in your pew, and we could just all pray and follow what it says very clearly here in the scriptures to pray for peace, the peace of Jerusalem. So why don't we just do that for a few minutes and then we'll carry on. Let's pray for Israel.
Amen. Amen. So good to hear the prayers of God's people. Jesus said, and my house shall be called a house of prayer. And uh, just good to hear everybody praying. Let me just pray for Israel as well. Father, thank you so much for your power, that you are all powerful and all knowing and all present. And we thank you that you know all the details we don't know we only know what we hear a little bit here and there but we don't know all that is is going on right now and 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 what is going on even with your timetable and you definitely made it clear to us that there would be wars and rumors of wars and that all these are are birth pains and and as these birth pains get stronger we know that uh that the baby is coming that um that uh not the baby but the second coming of of jesus christ and uh we thank you for that. We, we do pray for peace in Israel. Um, right now, they've declared war, and, and uh, that grieves your heart, Lord, that, that uh, your people are under attack. I pray for your safety, for your protection. Um, I pray that you would use this for good. It says very clearly in your word, and we know that in all things, God works for good to those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And Lord, um, even though this is not a good thing, uh, you can use it for good. You can use it to bring... Uh, people in Israel to a saving knowledge of the truth. There's only one way to Jesus, and that's uh, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. And and Lord, um, you don't get in just because you're born into the right family or or born because you have the right ethnicity. Um, you, you, we all have to choose to put our faith in, in you and you alone. And so I pray that you would use this hard, difficult, and dark time to bring lots of people to know you in a personal way and to experience the saving faith, the saving grace that is there in Jesus. Uh, we pray that you now uh, bless me as I give this uh, message and I pray that it would be a message that's, that builds people up as they leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are so many special days on our calendar. Um, I wasn't even aware of some of these days until I got an iPhone, and then on my iPhone I have a calendar, and then it makes a little dot, and I'm like, oh, what was my appointment for that? And I look, and it's like, oh, it's another special day. There was one particular special day that I was not aware of. It's called National Brothers Day, and um, my uh, wife uh, put a couple, nice little picture of Bo and Zach uh, together uh, on Facebook for National Brothers Day. There's, there's national, it seems like, everything day these days, and... I can't keep up with it all, and sometimes it seems a little almost hokey to me. But um, there are three days that I think that we never want to not acknowledge, and that would be Easter, Christmas, and Thanksgiving. And in that order, right? Like, what is the more important day than Easter? There is no more important day than Easter. What is uh, second to that is only Christmas, and I would say third is, is, is Thanksgiving. And why is that? Well, because we as God's people are supposed to have an attitude of gratitude. We're supposed to have an attitude of gratitude. What is your attitude? Well, your attitude should be an attitude of gratitude. You should be a thankful person, somebody who realizes that no matter what you're going through, you always have something to be thankful for. And the Psalms are just packed full of the, the, the call for God's people to give thanks to the Lord. And I just want to read one of those Psalms here. It's Psalm 138. And I'll, I'll invite you to turn with me in your Bibles. I'm going to be reading from the NASB version, but I think it'll also be up here on the, on the PowerPoint. So Psalm 138, just eight verses here. So many of the Psalms start like this one. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing praises to you before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth, and they will sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. Well, what a promise that is, hey, for Israel right now. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. 
That's a promise to hang on to. Verse 8. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. So many psalms start and end like that one. It's just a psalm of overflowing thankfulness. And obviously David, who wrote many of these psalms, had his, had his problems. Um, he wasn't perfect. He was often, uh, we remember his imperfections, don't we? Because they're well written about in, in, in God's word. But at the same time, even though he, like so many of us, like all of us, uh, missed the mark and wasn't perfect and could only come to Jesus, could only come to the Father through Jesus like all of us, um, he was a man that says it was after God's own heart. He, had, he was a man who was after God's own heart. And he was a man of thankfulness. He was a man who would write about these things and give thanks to the Lord many, many times over. And God inspired him to do that. And we still read about those um, prayers of thankfulness here in, in the Psalms. Giving thanks, what is that about anyways? You know, when I was younger, um, our family didn't go to church, but I was taught a prayer. And I was taught a prayer before I, uh, would, I would eat. And the prayer was this, God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Right? And I'm probably, you maybe taught your kids a very similar prayer, if not that very prayer. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. And then, of course, good parents, right? We, we, we tell our kids whenever they're given anything, you know, make sure you use your manners. Like, like say thank you. Use your manners. Say thank you. Right? And sometimes this whole idea of giving thanks can become sort of a, a formality, a cultural thing to do, good etiquette. Um, and it sort of misses the point in some ways. Because if all it is is just words coming out of our mouth because that's the polite thing to do or that's the right thing to do or that's the cultural thing to do, we haven't really captured what thankfulness is really all about. Giving thanks is really giving credit where credit is due. That's what it really means, is to give credit where credit is due. And our hearts, our hearts are prone to take credit for ourselves, to take the credit for ourselves. When something good happens, and we know that we were part of that, we had the privilege of being part of the work that God did to bring that about. We so often think, wow, am I not amazing? <laughs> I just, you know, look at that. Look at what I did there. That's where our heart can go. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a parable that Jesus told in Luke Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. I want to read that, that uh, parable today because I think it kind of captures where a lot of times our heart can be prone to be. And that's in uh, Luke chapter 12, verses, 20 th or verses 13 to 21. It's the famous uh, parable of the rich fool. Starting at verse 13, we read, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not, even, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many good things laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I don't know if you've ever read that story and thought to yourself, why is this man identified as a fool? Jesus identifies him as a fool. Like, is Jesus teaching us that saving is a bad thing? No, he's not. If you listen to the parable, the man had barns. And Jesus doesn't say he was a fool because he had barns. What made him a fool was that he was full of greed, and his barns that he had already weren't big enough, so he tore those ones down to build bigger ones so that he could keep even more for himself. That was why he was a fool. Because he wasn't content with what he had. If you notice, too, in that story, 
the land produces this great crop. It's another way for the parable to subtly say, God blessed him. But he doesn't even take God into the equation. He's talking to himself and he's like, what am I going to do with now all this abundance? And it's like, God isn't even inquired of or asked, Lord, what should I do? But it's, what should I do with all this abundance that I have now? I know what I'll do. I'll do this. And the whole parable is full of all these first person personal pronouns. I, 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 I. I'm going to do this. 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 And God isn't even in the equation. The man is full of greed and the man is full of self. He's focused on who, who he is, what he's done. And that's why he's a fool. He fails to have a thankful heart. He fails to give credit where credit is due. Because that's what it truly means to be thankful. It means to give credit where credit is due. And that's why this man is a fool. We need to beware of what we might call saving. Because yes, saving is a good thing. But don't use it as a cover-up for your greed. You know, don't say, oh, I'm just, um, you know, doing all this and holding on to all this because, well, you know, it's good to save. Well, maybe, but pray about that because maybe really what it is is it's your greed that wants to keep it all for yourself. And as that parable makes very clear, that's a foolish thing to do. We need to be rich toward God. And how are we rich toward God? In, in uh, Matthew um, chapter 25, I believe it is, Jesus tells the parable of the, um, the sheep and the goats. And what does he hold over the goats? He says, you know, I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I, I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. To be rich toward God is to look out at other people in their need and want to help them. To say, God has blessed me, and I don't know why he's blessed me with all this stuff, but it's not really mine, it's his. And now I'm sure he wants me to use all of this to bless others. This is what it is to not be foolish. This is what it is to be wise. We need to, be, we need to, be, we need to understand that, that, that giving thanks is not just using your manners. It's not just saying thank you. It's not just quickly mumbling a prayer, God is good, God is great, let us thank him for our food. Amen, we're done, we gave thanks. Being thankful is an attitude of the heart. And do you have that attitude today? Let me ask you, if, if you were to just take a moment to just think about what, what, what comes to your mind when you think of something that you're particularly thankful for. And whatever that thing might be, maybe it's family, maybe it's um, your salvation, maybe it's um, you know, just the, the basic needs that you have faithfully been provided by God every day for you. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe some of you are actually gotten to the place in your walk with the Lord that you can be thankful for uh, something really hard that's happened in your life that most people would look at and say, how can you possibly be thankful for that? But you know, that promise, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. In all things God works for good. So, so maybe you've gotten to that place in your, in your walk with the Lord that, that you can honestly, truly, from the heart, give thanks for something that most people would say that's incredibly hard. I want to give um, four different reasons that we as God's people should be thankful, that we should have an attitude of gratitude. Um, and the first one is, is that it's God's will for us to give thanks. Often we make God's will this mysterious concept that is very difficult to determine. What is God's will for my life? Well, God tells us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, he says this, In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There it is. You're wondering, what is God's will for my life? God's will for your life is in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, I said Thanksgiving is a great day because we should remember to be thankful. But hopefully it's almost like not that important of a day because we, every day, recognize that it's an important thing to give thanks. That this is just part of who we are. Because we are following the Lord's will. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is really just, you know, simple obedience. But how often, you know, do we fail to do this? We have another story of, of Jesus healing ten lepers. These are men who had leprosy. 
And leprosy was this terrible disease that made it so that they couldn't feel pain, which maybe at first sounds like a good, good thing, but if you can't feel pain, well, guess what? You subject your body constantly to things that are very damaging to your body, and eventually your body just gets completely wrecked. And now you've got all these sores and open sores all over your body, and, and these people would be ostracized and, and, and sent out to a place outside of the city, outside of the towns, outside of the community, where they'd have to just kind of live isolated all by themselves because they had leprosy. And if they walked around, they had to check, call out leper, they, they had to call out unclean, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine having to do this? Well, there's a story of how one day Jesus saw these 10 lepers. Of course, they're hanging out together because no one else will hang out with them. And he heals all 10 of them. They are completely restored, and, and it's a miracle. It's, it's a miracle, and I, I don't use that word lightly. Miracles don't happen every day. This is a miracle, and, and this is incredible, and, and these people are completely restored to full health. But guess how many of them returned to give thanks? One. We're told only one did, and that one was a Samaritan. A Samaritan, of course, was like a half-Jewish, half-Gentile person. And uh, they, were, they were not well liked by, this, by the Jewish people, and the Jewish people didn't, didn't like them, and they didn't like the Jewish people. But it was a Samaritan who was the only one who returned to give thanks. And Jesus even says, he says, where are the other nine? Did they not come back to give thanks? And, you know, I'm wondering, why didn't they come back to give thanks? And I think the, the, the key to the answer to that question is found in the fact that the only one that did come back to give thanks was a Samaritan. And the reason that the nine Jewish men did not come back to give thanks is because they felt entitled. They felt like, isn't it, isn't it a given that Jesus is going to help me? I'm, I'm one of his people, of course. Of course he should help me. He shouldn't let me get sick in the first place. They had this, this, this attitude of entitlement. And entitlement is really the opposite of, of thankfulness. Now, I say this is a, an easy thing because it's just simple obedience. In everything, give thanks. But it's really not easy in another sense, because it doesn't say in the good things give thanks, or in the things that you would naturally want give thanks, but it says in everything give thanks. So even when something really hard happens in your life, you're supposed to give thanks for that too, for this is the Lord's will. I was watching um, a, a testimony given this week, and many of you probably know this name, Johnny Erickson. Johnny Erickson was this um, lady who is a quadriplegic. She had an accident when she was younger and it caused her to be completely paralyzed from the neck down. And, and Johnny talked about how for many, many years the thing that she, she wanted to hear so much was all the different stories of Jesus healing people because she thought to herself, you know, maybe someday God will heal me. And this would kind of give her some hope and, and she would get excited about the idea that possibly God will do a miracle in my life and he'll heal me. Well, one day, I guess, she went to some, you know, kind of event that was sort of like this healing ministry, and, and uh, she, was told, she tells the story that she and a bunch of other people that were in wheelchairs were wheeled off over in the corner, and, and they were all kind of kept together, and then this, this event was going on, and they could hardly even see what was happening, but they could hear these loud shouts of praise and everything, and they thought to themselves, somebody over there is getting healed. But then she says, she said, you know, I was hoping, though, that they would come over and heal me. Hey, come over to the hard cases over here, right? Of course, they never came over, and eventually they were just all these people in wheelchairs were wheeled out the door and sent down the elevator, and through that whole experience, it caused her to get very disillusioned with, with God. She was hurting, and she was, she, was, she was bitter. She was wondering, why hasn't God healed me? And she went into a pretty dark place for a long time. She talks about how she just wanted to lay in her bed all by herself, draw the curtains totally in the dark, and just be alone. Just leave me alone. That's how she felt for a while. But then through time, she began to discover that she needed to stop being bitter. She needed to stop wondering all the time, why hasn't God healed me? That possibly God hasn't healed her because he wants to bring some good out of this. She actually started to think about that. And the more she started to think about that, the more God did a work in her life and changed her heart. And now she actually tells her story that she says, even though from not just being a quadriplegic, but this poor lady also has chronic pain, and now she actually has stage 3 cancer. But even through all of that, she says, I wouldn't trade the, my health. I wouldn't have, if I could have perfect physical health, I wouldn't take that. If it meant that I would lose out on all that I've gained from these hard things that I've gone through. 
Because she's like, these hard things that I've gone through have totally changed my heart. And I can honestly be a person who's thankful even with all the things that I've gone through. And she's like, I'm so thankful that God has been able to do that for me. She is a living testimony that it is true that we as people are able to give thanks in everything. It's possible. We just have to choose to give thanks. It doesn't mean that we're saying these things over here that have happened in our life are good things. No, there's bad things. But God can even use bad things to bring about good. That's what it's saying. And we can give thanks for that. Second reason that we as God's people should give thanks is that giving thanks encourages an atmosphere of of people being built up. Or giving thanks promotes a culture that builds people up. It builds people up. You know, it's my, I've this the last month or so, just really sensed that God wants me to pray for something um, for our church. And one of the things I want to just keep praying for for our church is that When people come through those doors and then they hear for like an hour and a half or whatever it is and then they go out those doors. My prayer is that when they go out those doors, they feel more built up than when they came in those doors. And you know, I'm not the only one responsible for that happening through giving God's word. Um, The worship is obviously something that I, I hope you guys just are built up from that. Um, But it's also all the conversations that take place before the service, um, you know, after the service. You know, we have lots of great conversations with one another. But are we creating a place here where people are being built up because of the things that we are talking about? You know, and I've been preaching through Ephesians, and I'm taking a little break from that today, obviously, and I'm, I'm focusing on Thanksgiving. But if we went back to Ephesians for a second here, The Apostle Paul has been telling the Ephesians how they should talk. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, he says this. He says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. Edification is a fancy word for building people up. That's what it means. To edify someone is to to build them up Um, from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. This is the way we should talk. So, so how should we talk? If we shouldn't have any unwholesome, that's a negative, if we shouldn't have any unwholesome words coming out of our mouth that don't build people up, that, that tear them down, how should we talk? Well, if we, if we flip over um, to the verse that we looked at last week, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, it says, And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, And then he says this, he says, but rather giving of thanks. Giving of thanks. This is so important if we want to have a a place, this church to be a place where people are built up. That when people come in here, we're not simply because it's a formality or because it's the right thing to say or we're using our manners really well. No, that we are people who have a heart that has an attitude of gratitude. That we truly are thankful. And that we, re- we know that what it means to be thankful is to give credit where credit is due. We're giving credit to God. And that's very obvious. And that, that's going to build people up. That's what it says there. Now, as I mentioned, I want people to leave here more built up than when they came in. That does not mean, though, that there, you, when I'm preaching, there will never be a time where you feel kind of convicted. Or where you feel like, mm, getting a bit rebuked today. Because it says in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says... Um, For God's word, for all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The words rebuking and correcting are are kind of words that we don't often like to hear. Nobody really loves to be rebuked. Nobody really loves to be corrected. But God's word does that. And so there might be times where you come in here and you feel it's like God's word is rebuking me today. Or God's word is correcting something in my life today. And that's a good thing. And that can actually cause you to be built up because you can realize, I need to make an adjustment. I need to make an maybe Maybe today is even a day like that. Maybe you're like, you know what? I've been, I've been complaining a fair bit. I've been talking to everybody about how hard my life is and about how challenging, difficult it is. And everybody that's around me just feels like, oh, man, they got a lot of problems in their life. I never am being very thankful. Well, that's, that's a correction that, that we need to make. And I believe that we can be built up 
as long as we, you know, submit to God's word and God's will and, and do what he tells us to do. And, you know, if we do these things, we're going to be this church that people are really drawn to. Because in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, it says this, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Whom you appear as lights in the world. You know, being a light in the world is, is being a place where when people come here, they're like, there's something different about that place. Like, that place, people there, there's something about those people. It's like, it's like, it's like a light. It's like a, it's like a fresh breath of air. It's like something very different than what I experience everywhere else in this world. That's the kind of thing that we want to be as a church. We want to be a place where people, when they come here for the first time, they're like, there's something different about that place. And I believe that it has a lot to do with having that attitude of gratitude, a, a true heart that is, truly gives credit where credit is due. Okay, the third, the third reason we as God's people should be thankful is that giving thanks is humility. That's what it is. It's humility. Um, it would do us well to put in the back of our minds this little phrase. And the phrase is this. It comes right from the Bible. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Say that with me. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, who of us want God, who, by the way, the Bible describes as all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present. You can't get away from him. He's all-present. He's all-powerful. There's nothing that he can't do. He's, he's all-knowing. He knows everything about us. Who wants someone like that to be opposed to us? Now, who wants someone like that to be for us? Think about that as we think about that phrase, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And I love how it gives grace to the humble because that's what we all need is grace. Grace is that unmerited favor that God offers to all who will receive it. Grace. But grace is only offered to, not the proud, but to the humble. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. He said, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. It's pretty clear. Giving thanks is an attitude of the heart that says God is the one who deserves the credit for everything. James chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that. It says every, not some, not most, but every, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. I want everyone to do something here. Just take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. One more time. Breathe out. Yeah. That breath that you just took, that breath was not yours. It's God's. Every breath that we take is a gift from him. Every good thing Given and every perfect gift is from above. Being humble is not walking around and trying to convince ourselves and convince everybody else that we're no good at anything. That's not what humbleness is. Humility is actually just about the opposite of that. Humility is, is believing that with God's strength, there's nothing I can't do. If God is for me, then who can be against me? God is with me, then I have nothing to fear. If God called me, then he will equip me to do it. But you know what? Every time, it's not I can do it. It's with God's strength, I can do it. It's if God enables, I can do it. If it's God is with me, if he's with me, then who can be against me? Pride is, is having, on the other hand, pride is having a sense of entitlement. Pride is, is taking credit for everything that we do. Pride is believing, ultimately, I don't need God. That's pride. 
And in Romans 1, Paul describes this cyclical whirlpool of darkness that people get sucked into. He talks about the depravity of man, is the theological term for it. How dark people can get. How dark any one of us can get. If we get sucked into this cyclical whirlpool that takes us down, down, down. Now the question becomes, how would somebody fall into that whirlpool to begin with? Like, how would that happen? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. He says this. He says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. In other words, they did not give him the credit. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. This is how they get in the cyclical whirlpool that takes you down, down, down. The depravity of man is that I can do it. I don't need God. Proud people don't give thanks, at least not from the heart. They might do it as a formality, but from the heart it never comes. The fourth point and the final point that we should be people who give thanks is because giving thanks is our path to salvation. It's our path to salvation. Salvation is the greatest gift of all. And it's freely offered to all who will receive it. In John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, Yet to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. To those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be the children of God. The greatest gift of all, salvation, is is offered to all of us. But will we receive it? You see, it's offered to all of us, and probably if you talk to somebody, they'd be like, oh yeah, sure, I want that. But there's a catch. Here's the catch. You know what the catch is? The catch is, you've got to let go of your pride. You've got to let go of your pride. In order to receive, if you're holding on so tightly to me, then you can't receive the gift because your hands are closed, clutching on to you. But when you let go of you in humility, you can receive the greatest gift of all. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace... That's that unmerited favor again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Maybe sometimes you wondered, you know, why is it that Christians constantly talk about, when they talk about the gospel, they stress over and over again, at least they hope they do, that it's a free gift. It's a free gift. I mean, don't we want people to be good? Don't we want people to work? Don't we want people to try to to do good things? Why are we always talking about how it's not about that? It's about receiving this free gift. that's freely yours. You don't have to do anything. It's yours. It's, It's grace. It's unmerited favor. You just have to receive it. Well, when you think about it, if it's somewhat about my works or anything has to do with my works, that's pride. Even good things. It's like... I'm going to do some good things over here in my strength, with my power, because I'm able, and I can do this on my own. And I'm going to try to earn my merit with God. That's, that's, That's works. But it's also pride. And that's why this isn't a gift about works. This is a gift about grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not as a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. There's no boasting. You know, I've heard it said that, you know, what what is a Christian? Well, a Christian is one beggar telling another beggar where they found some bread, right? It's kind of a good analogy. That's who we are in some ways. Like, we're just people lost like everybody else, but we found somebody who knows the way and we're following him. This is a really, really hard gift, though. I said it's, it's, it's the greatest gift of all salvation, but it's so hard to explain. And I try almost every week to explain it, but then I'm encouraged because of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, this is how Paul describes the gift of salvation. He says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
So if I'm having a hard time describing the gospel, that's good. Because that's the way it should be. No one should be able to be like, oh, he completely clarified that for me. I now know everything there is to know about that. No. This is such an incredible gift that it's, it's described as the indescribable gift. Whatever gift you've ever had, and I'm talking about the greatest gifts that we receive, family, our spouses, um, you name it. I can describe those gifts. I cannot describe the gift of salvation. It's the indescribable gift. And Paul looks at it and he goes, thanks be. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. But like every gift, it's a gift that needs to be received. So some of you maybe have heard time and time and time again about this gift, but it's only yours if you'll receive it. And how do we receive it? We receive it by faith. We put our faith, not in ourselves, we let go of our pride, and in humility we say yes to God. And we receive the indescribable gift that we call salvation. And if that's a gift that you haven't received yet, then I strongly encourage you to receive that gift. Today is the day of salvation, it says. It's a gift you want to receive. It's not a gift you want to leave. You know, there are gifts that get neglected, get left. Sometimes people buy gifts, right? It's, 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 it's a special day and some people buy gifts and it's like, you know, you, you don't receive it. You just leave it. You just bury it in a drawer somewhere. That, you, that's a gift you didn't receive. Receive this gift. Take this gift. Put your faith in this gift. The one we call Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your indescribable gift. Thank you for all the things that you give us. The very breath that we're breathing right now is a gift from you. And we give thanks for that too. We give thanks for the good harvest that just happened. We give thanks for family. We give thanks for our spouses. We give thanks for our church. We give thanks for even the hard things, Lord. Because we know that in all things, you work for good. And you can even use the hard things, the evil things, the, the things that are wrong, and it shouldn't have happened because that wasn't right, you can still use those things even for good. You can bring about good in those things. I thank you for people like Johnny Erickson who are a living testimony of the fact that we can give thanks for everything, not just for the things that we like or we want, but we can give thanks for everything. And I pray that you'd help us to continue to cultivate an attitude of gratitude, that we would give thanks not just with our mouths, but that we would truly give thanks from the heart giving credit where credit is due. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here today who has not yet received the greatest gift of all, the indescribable gift of salvation, that today would be the day where maybe they just come up and talk to somebody, you know, how do I receive this indescribable gift? Maybe they would take the story that matters home and read it for themselves. Or maybe they'd take the Bible home and just start reading it from cover to cover. I don't know, Lord, how they're going to get started on receiving that gift, but I, I pray that whatever it is that's holding them back from receiving that gift, you'd Help them to overcome that obstacle. Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.